Good, don't forget. Great, so welcome. Uh, I'm going to actually read some of the things in the chat. So glad to have you all here. If you haven't met me, my name is Tutu. I am uh, currently the Youth Engagement Coordinator and next week I will be the Assistant Director for Food Access Initiative. So still in transition, but really happy to have you all here. And I'm just going to voice out some of the things in the chat, some people's favorite things to do in the fall. Jenny loves to go for, for trail walks and to find cool mushrooms. Joanne loves making soup and cookies. I love soup. Susanna loves the long walks. Maddie, uh, just hanging in the park and going on walks to see the leaves, eating pumpkin pie. Nice, Giselle. Actually, I think there might be pumpkin pies at the farm stand this week or next week. Um, Eve, hi, uh, loves a fall trip to the green market and baking bread. Jacqueline loves making mulled wine. And Oscar <laughs> likes going to haunted houses. Great. Um, it is so good to see you all here. And I will introduce our speaker in just a little bit. Um, we do have a couple of community agreements that, that you know, we've gone over. And, you know, uh, I'm trying to wonder, I wonder if I should, I don't think we have to go through them, but basically let's treat each other with respect and um, listen to one another and uh, be open to hearing um, and to listening to Jenny and also opening open to sharing with one another. Um, so two weeks ago, we had Kelly Corton from Corton Farms talking to us about how to run a farm business. And today we are talking to Jenny who owns her own business. And um, I thought it was important for us to be able to compare those, those, just those two experiences as folks think about whether or not they want to start their own business, whether or not they want to go into farming. And I'm excited. Jenny is a friend and also an FDAC member, so knows Grow and Macy and the green market really well. And I'm going to hand over to you, Jenny, if you can introduce yourself and tell us who you are, what you do, and how you got connected to the market. So Oh, green market. Yes, thank you for that warm and lovely introduction, Tutu. And hello to everyone. I'm happy to be here. And I'm also happy to hear your experiences for this fall. I'm in the Bronx in New York, and I was just telling Tutu, it's getting a bit chilly now. So, you know, the scarves are coming out, the cups of teas are coming out. So I just love the essence and the energy that you all are bringing with this new fall season. And in terms of introduction, my name is, I go by Coach Jenny, ba Jenny Mack, sorry, <laughs> Coach Jenny Mack, but my full name is Janelle McKinley, in case you want to find me on LinkedIn or different platforms. I am a certified holistic nutritionist. And what does that mean? Holistic means thinking about the full body experience, right? Your mind, your body, your spirit, bringing that to the forefront of making people feel better. So I'm a certified holistic nutritionist. I'm also a fitness coach. So I love to teach people how to move their bodies through dancing, through music in order to feel better, right? To feel good in their bodies. And I'm also a plant-based chef. So this is where the food element comes in on top of the nutrition. A plant-based chef really focused on eating foods from mother nature. So visiting the farmer's markets on Wednesdays and Saturdays. I also have one locally on Tuesdays that I visit in the Bronx. And looking at what foods are in season. So yes, pumpkins are in season now. And what I do is take that very raw, uh, nutrient-dense food and create fun and exciting recipes. So that is all of the things that I do. I have uh, a business. It's under my name, Jenny Mac LLC. It's a limited liability company. And under that, I have many programs. So one of my signature programs is called the EAT School, again, bringing in food and nutrition. And the principles of EAT, if you think of E, that's educate, A for adopt healthier habits, and T for transform. So that is um, a lot of what I do, but surprisingly enough, I have done many things before creating this business. This business is about a year and a half old, 
Before that, I owned a fitness business called Grills and Granola. And I sunset that business a few months ago to focus on nutrition, coaching, education, full-time. And then before then, I worked about 10 years in accounting. So I worked in 10 years in public accounting, and that afforded me so many different opportunities to travel and see the world. Um, and that led me here today. So we all have very unique experiences, right? We all have very unique passions. And I'm very excited about this conversation um, that, that Tutu is allowing me to engage in because as Tutu said, we can think about how we can bring our love, our passions, and how we can solve a problem very uniquely, right? We That doesn't necessarily mean that we have to be in one dedicated field in the food industry. We can do many things, right? If we just think about the ecosystem here, we talked about a few things, making soup, baking bread, going for long walks, eating pumpkin pie. So we fit very uniquely in the ecosystem, in the food system. And it's just very important for you to think about your passions, right? And how you can turn your passion into your career. So essentially that's what I did. Nice. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about, you, you know, the origins of your business and I, um, when it was started, why did you start it? Like, was there any an impetus for it? Was there something that happened that was like, ah, this is, you know, a need or a void in, in this field that I, that I think that I can, I can meet. Yes. Yeah. So how did I start the Eat School? Why did I create Jenny Mac LLC? Well, it really started as me being my own guinea pig. Um, so I'll ask a question to the audience as well, or we'll have a conversation, right? So feel free to continue to use the chat box, but has anyone heard of lupus as a chronic disease? Do you know someone that has lupus? Have you heard of lupus? Let me know in the chat. If not, um, I will definitely tell you all about it, right? So that's essentially how I got started with my own business. Yes, Joanne, it's an autoimmune disorder. Exactly. So I have lupus. I was diagnosed with lupus in 2017. And just as Joanne said, it's an autoimmune disorder or disease. There's a disease in your body. And basically what happens is your immune system attacks itself, right? And no two people with lupus are the same. Everyone that has lupus has different episodes or they are faced with different ailments, right? So it can attack your brain, it can attack your lung, your kidneys, your skin. And unfortunately, there's no cure for it. So I was diagnosed with this chronic disease, right? After spending about a solid seven years or so working in corporate America, working as a public accountant, I was working 80 to 100 hours a week. It was a very, very demanding career. And it led me to get sick. So I got really sick. I was I was in the hospital and I was told that I would need to be on dialysis. Has anyone heard of what happened to Nick Cannon? Anyone heard of Nick Cannon or Selena Gomez, right? So these are celebrities that have lupus. Nick Cannon had to get treatment for uh, kidney issues and Selena Gomez actually had a kidney transplant, right? So it, it made it very relatable to, to hear that celebrities actually can have diseases too, right? <laughs> um, so I was in the hospital, I was hospitalized for a month and the doctors basically said, here, all of your medications, just take them, right? Just take the medications. And something in me said that there is more to life than just taking prescription drugs, right? Knowing that prescription drugs serve a purpose and they save lives, but I knew there was more to life than just taking drugs, right? And uh, this led me to doing research, right? So Google, sometimes Google is our friend, sometimes it's our enemy. <laughs> so I started Googling, well, how can I manage this chronic disease? And I came across the benefits of adopting a plant-based lifestyle. Has anyone heard of plant-based? Do we know what plant-based means? Again, feel free to put it in the chat, but essentially that is the foundation of my business. It's focused on helping people, especially women that look like me and communities, right? 
that have these chronic diseases and looking for ways to, what I say, reduce inflammation, right? So reduce the severity of their disease and again, ultimately feel better. So feel like they, they can live happy, happy and healthy lives through transitioning. When I say transitioning to a plant-based lifestyle, essentially eating healthier foods, but eating foods that come from mother nature. So this is how food is aligned to what I do, right? It's the foundation and it's central to what I do. But what I do is I help coach people on how they can eat healthier foods. Jenny, when you yeah. say plant-based, do you mean, I, I guess, what, tell us about percentages. Are you looking at percentages or are you saying vegan or? <laughs> <laughs> Very good question, Tutu. And yes, again, if anyone has any thoughts on what plant-based is, please feel free to use the chat. We'd we'll just love to continue the conversation around this. But when I say plant-based, it, it really means eating whole foods, whole foods that are plant-based. So foods that you would grow on the farm, right? Your kales, your collard greens, your Swiss chard, your beets, your broccoli, anything that grows from a seed to a plant. Essentially, that's what I'm focused on, um, helping people incorporate into their lives. Now, I personally am vegan, plant-based, but I didn't become vegan plant-based overnight. It was a transition. And what I had to do was learn how to cook with foods that I never learned about, right? Growing up, there was just a limited knowledge of foods, right? We were just only eating, we were only eating foods that were available to us, right? Um, so it was, it was a matter of relearning or learning about this wonderful species of fruits and vegetables, beans, legumes, nuts and seeds that we have in our environment that mother nature has afforded us and finding delicious ways to cook them. On top of that, bringing the cultural element, right? So we have so much culture in food. Food brings us together as humans. So thinking about different cultures that I can incorporate into plants. And a lot of the foods that we eat are foundational with plants, right? Our spices, our herbs, our seasoning, those are plants. And to answer your question more specifically, Tutu, it's not necessarily about just going 100% vegan, right? Again, it's about inco incorporating healthy foods into our lifestyle, into our diet, also focused on sustainability, right? So these foods are abundant. They're growing again from seed to root to plant. So how can we incorporate more of those foods in our diet, not only for our health, but for the environment, for the welfare of our human civilization, of our animals, right? All of those beautiful things. So it doesn't have to be, you know, gold, cold turkey. You could go cold to tofu, but it's just about <laughs> eating more fruits and vegetables and crowding your plate and then just enjoying the different diversities of plants. It's beautiful. And how did you get from, um, okay, using yourself as a guinea pig, seeing really great results to, oh, I think I should start a business in this. And like leaving, at, I guess at that point, did you leave your job or did you use yourself as a guinea pig while you're working and then think this is something that I need to be spending time on so I can empower other women who are going through the same thing I am? Yes, yeah. So it was certainly a journey. I was still working full time in, in corporate America. So at this point, I was working for a large company. I could say I'm no longer there, but American Express, right? I was working for American Express in their accounting department. And it was a, a good financially secure career. You know, I worked nine to five um, and there was stability there. I say financial stability. But meanwhile, you know, I'm still going through this healing process and I did so much research. And what I learned is that there were only 3% of nutritionists out there in America that are of people of color. 3%, right? 3% to serve the millions of people of color, right? So I saw that there was a huge gap in terms of 
people that could provide a specific ser service to meet our to meet the needs of our community. On top of that, um, after just doing so much research, I said, you know what? There is a huge gap in our in our world, in our uh, nation, and we don't have the people that we need to serve our community. So I said, you know what? Why not just become certified myself? I went into this rabbit hole. I did the research myself. I transitioned to plant-based. I went from stage four kidney disease to coming down to being close to normal with my kidney function, right? So I had success in me. And what that meant is if I could share my story and how I've improved my overall well-being, then I'm sure there's someone else out there that I can help someone that looks like me, someone that can relate to me. So then that led me to become a certified holistic nutritionist, right? I did the research and I saw what accredited programs were out there that I can afford, that were in my budget, that I can do on the side. So I was still working full time, but I was studying about four hours every couple of days. And it took about a year and a half for me to become a certified holistic nutritionist. And during that time, I applied for a business. I said, you know what? I don't know exactly what I'm going to do, but I'm going to do something. Something is on my heart, right? I have this passion. So that's where I decided to get a LLC, which is a limited liability company. And that way you could protect yourself as a sole proprietor or a business owner from the risk of your business. So that's why I elected to get an LLC. And then we went from there. The story goes from there. And did you did you speak to somebody about like which one you wanted to be in? Was that was a lawyer involved or just did you do research? Or, I guess if someone's thinking about potentially starting a business, um, how do they know which kind of business they want to be in? Yeah, that's a very good question. So how do you know which, because there's so many different entity types. Again, there's a sole proprietor, um, there's a limited liability company, there's a limited liability partnership, there are S corporations, there are C corporations. I mean, there are just so many ways that you can become an entity. So it does get very overwhelming. Um, a lawyer is a good person to talk to initially, but sometimes we don't have that access, right? I would say if you're looking to get into business yourself, uh, sole proprietorship is a good way to start, but an LLC, as I was just describing, is a good way for you to separate your personal self, your personal assets, your personal liability from the business. And that's very important for example, if someone, you know, has a discrepancy with you, things happen, right? If there is a liability to your business, then that liability is to your business. And then they cannot go over uh, or they can't go against your personal assets and liabilities. So that's why it's very important to separate the two. Now, the reason why I was able to determine which one to get into is from my CPA. <laughs> so being a certified public accountant, we actually had to uh, study business, um, which included a legal business specifically. So I was able to understand the different types of entities. But yes, first chain of command, if you have access to a business lawyer, I actually just remembered that there actually is an organization. It is called Think, uh, think small, start big. Have you heard of that, Tutu? Think small, start big. I can also share this resource, but they actually provide free resources to individuals. You have to meet certain thresholds. Um, you can't make too much money, those kind of things. Um, but they provide you with free resources, like legal, legal resources. They can also there you go. Start small, think big. Exactly. And I would encourage everyone who's thinking about starting a new business, go there as a first resource, because if you are qualified, then they provide you with so many resources. They can provide you with mentorship. They can provide you with templates for your partnership. Actually, I use them when I used to have my fitness business 
and I became a new partner to an existing partner. So we had to complete um, a partnership amendment for our business and start small, think big actually helped us um, create that template. And we were able to sign that partnership and change our partnership. So very helpful resource. Um, and if you don't know where to start, you know, there are people out there that can help you find the right entity. Yeah. And I think I know in, in New York, there's a women in business, minority women in business resource. I'm also going to look this up, but I believe it helps um, women and specifically women of color to help start businesses. Yes, minority and women, minority uh, women in women business. In business. Mm -hmm. There's also um, Hello Alice, which we can also talk more about um, funding. There are many organizations out there that help promote, especially people of color um, in women and different types of organizations. They help promote their business by providing them with ground funding. Um, baseline funding, because a lot of the times, you know, we don't have $50,000 in our back pocket and we want to start these businesses, but we need resources. So these companies like Start Small, Think Big, Hello Alice, they're free to sign up and they send communication at least once a week and they let you know what uh, organizations are providing grants and funds. So I've been fortunate with my prior fitness company with Grills and Granola to raise $50,000 for our business during COVID. So we were able to serve 500 women and provide them with virtual fitness experiences because of that and free mental health coaching. And then with my current company, because I've learned how to apply for funding, you know, you essentially have to have a resume ready. You have to have a business plan ready. It doesn't have to be complicated, but you at least have to know what problem you're solving and how you are unique as a business owner, as an organization to solve that problem. So that has to be crystal clear. And once it is, you can apply for so many different opportunities. So with my current business, I've been able to also get grants and funding to help supplement my business expenses, essentially. That kind of leads us into that next question. Like, If if I wanted to start a business, maybe not tomorrow, but next week, um, what would I need? Do I need um, initial capital? Do I need some kind of, a, like, do I need savings to have to start with? Or is there a way to go with your idea, go with your business proposal and find people to, to fund that, find people to support you. And that, yeah, I guess walk us through some of the things that you need. And I think you you, you already started to talk through business proposal um, and a, re a ready resume. What are other things that you needed to get your business off the ground or other folks might need to get a new business off the ground? Yeah, that's a very good question. I would say how it so the question around like how much funding do you need based on your business will really depends on what type of business you're getting into for example if you're looking to get into becoming a farmer there's that baseline infrastructure that you need you need to source the plot of land right you need to get machinery so those are expenses that are probably more expensive than most businesses because you have to fund that infrastructure. So you have to think about those, what they call startup costs, those costs that you would have to spend in order to start your business, right? So you add all of those up, your cost of goods, what does that cost and what does that entail? And then you also need to be very clear in terms of your revenue estimates, Right. So how are you going to generate money if you're thinking about becoming a farmer? Again, are you going to sell your food at a local farmer's market? Are you going to um, contract with a, an a entity, a government entity in order to get your uh, produce into communities in a very unique way? Right. So there are so many ways to think through how to generate revenue. Again, that just goes back to your unique proposition, right? Your unique value proposition. How will you solve a problem and what makes your business very unique? In my case, to create the Eat School, 
my startup costs were actually what I'll say quite minimal because my program, my offerings are virtual. I was also thinking about sustainability, right? How can I grow a business quite easily, but how can I also reach people quite easily too? And because we have the internet and because uh, we're you know, kind of getting out of this pandemic and people are looking for ways to get healthier, there is a huge market around wellness. So it, it was a very easy way to penetrate the market. And all I really just needed was a good laptop, right? I invested in a good laptop. I got subscriptions through uh, my website, right? So I created, a, I got a domain, I created a website. I also got subscriptions with uh, different companies like an accounting system called QuickBooks so that I can track my books and records on a weekly basis at minimum or at least a month. Um, Zoom, right? I got a Zoom subscription. So it's just all of these different fees that we have to think about on a daily and a monthly basis for us to sustain our operations and our business. And I personally was able, what I say, to bootstrap my startup costs. And that means that I funded it myself using my savings. And, you know, my, uh, the most important part of what I'm doing is how am I getting a return on my investment? How am I making revenue? I'm making revenue through charging my customers um, consultation fees. So if someone wants to book a one-to-one -one meeting with me, they pay X number of dollars. If they want to work with me for three or six months, right? They pay into a subscription. So there are just so many ways to earn revenue these days. And the access that we have is just incredible, especially having access to the internet. So just thinking about, again, your very unique proposition, how you can solve a problem, what makes you unique, and how can you bring it in a new way? How can you ride the journey along with technology so that you can get access to people in very unique ways? Great. Um, I want to ask you a question about the business, but first I want to ask, was it hard to make the jump from accounting to nutrition? Those are very different fields. And and what did you need to help you just fill up all those gaps that you you might you might not have known or that you might have learned as you were researching? But it feels like a really big uh, career jump. Yes, it was it was a huge career jump in the sense of you know, I was working with a completely different population. So I worked, when I worked in accounting, I specifically did consulting. So banks specifically would hire me. Banks like Bank of America, Chase, Capital One, these huge banks that make millions and billions of dollars every year. They would hire me through an organization to help them, what I say, mitigate risk. So prevent something from happening. And my niche was consumer products. So for example, if you go into a bank and you open up a new credit card, you as a consumer should be provided with all of the terms and conditions of opening that credit card. And believe it or not, some banks have been abusing consumers by not being very clear in terms of what the terms are, what the conditions are, and charging an astronomical APR, right? So my role and my responsibility was to make sure that banks were not abusing consumers, right? And that was a very unique <laughs> um, niche, uh, but having that experience, right? Being client-focused, being consumer-focused, thinking about how I can solve a problem really translated into my business. So that was where I was able to think about very clearly what problem am I solving and always come back to that in terms of clarity. And by being clear in terms of what problem I'm solving, I can be very thoughtful, thoughtful and methodical and I can bring in those people, those communities uh, in need of that specific or solving that specific problem. So the clearer I was in terms of what problem I was solving, uh, the better chance I was getting of getting the right people into my community. 
So very different in terms of accounting versus a nutrition coach, but very applicable in terms of foundations of starting a business. So again, thinking about solving a problem and that helped translate into what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. I would say one other very unique um, strategy that was very popular in what I did was this terminology called outsourcing. Has anyone heard of outsourcing? Do you know what I mean? Outsourcing. So basically what um, this company did that I worked for was they would outsource their, their um, what do you call it? They would outsource their, their needs, right? They would outsource their needs to international companies. So for example, I was put on this project in India to help build this back office, what we call the service delivery team based out of India. And the reason why they did that is essentially it was cheap labor. So this company hired uh, people based out of India so that they can do the same amount of work with the same quality or even better for cheaper. So what I did was take that principle into what I'm doing today and I'm essentially outsourcing my talent for my social media team. <laughs> so I've hired a social media team based out of the Philippines. And I'm thinking about that same concept. How can they produce quality work um, at the same volume or even more volume for half or less than half the price of what I would pay for someone here? Now, there are pros and cons of working with people offshore in terms of just getting them familiar with the language, right? There's training that's needed, but I was able to take that foundational skill and implement it into my business. Oh, that's, that's fascinating. And, and I guess, you know, also the standard of living in outside of America is a little lower. So Jenny is not saying that she was not paying people a fair wage. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, <laughs> yeah. Um, something you said uh, sparked a question in my mind. Um, how do you, you know, if you have a business idea, right, and you think that your idea is new and it's it's revolutionary, but, you know, how do you make sure that that it actually is a need, that there's actually a demand for, for your idea and that you're not replicating an existing idea, but just almost like repackaging it? Like, what are what are some ways that you made sure that, that you are giving something that's that you know definitely was needed and that there would be yeah. um, interest in the market for it? That is such a good question, Tutu. And I'm so fired up and excited about this question because I'm actually in a process of re-strategizing my business. And I also wanna just briefly talk about this is that no business stays the same. A business is just like raising a child, right? Where it grows, it evolves, you have to teach uh, the business, the individual, the team, new things, new ways of working, right? So in terms of my unique proposition, my need, Joanne just said it, right? I know that very unique, I'm very unique in terms of this market. 97% of the nutritionists don't look like me. And if we think about the way the world is going, uh, the minority will be the majority. So we have to think about it from that mindset on how can we bring very unique, culturally attuned experiences to our world? And how do you know if, if your genius idea, because I know many of you have genius ideas, you are the future. So how do you know your genius idea is valid? Well, the first thing I would do is do market research. Market research is very important for you to value, validate. Well, first of all, very important for you to ask your community whether they have a problem, right? Whether they have this very unique problem and for you to value, validate the needs of that problem, right? So for example, right now, I'm doing market research and it's very specific to see whether people with lupus want to adopt a plant-based diet very specific survey and I've sent it out 
and I've gotten already about 66 responses with people and it's still ongoing, but people one are interested because they're responding to the survey. And as I look at the data and the metrics, I see that people one have lupus, women have lupus, and they also have challenges, right? This is about solving a problem, solving a challenge, helping people with their challenge. So people have challenges eating the right foods, right? They don't know what to eat, what's anti-inflammatory, what we call, right? So foods that are healthy, that are gonna reduce the inflammation in their body. The information is valid. So you do your market research, you get validation that you actually have a problem. They actually have a problem and you actually have a solution to that problem. So market research is so important. Then once you do the market research, the second step I would say is do beta testing, right? So do beta testing, meaning use that same community that you asked for the information from and you give them your product, you give them your service and maybe you give them your product, your service at a discounted price, but it's again, a way for you to validate that you are solving a problem. Right. And then what happens is you give them your product, you give them your service, they will give you feedback. They will tell you whether it's working or it's not. And that information is also validity, right? That information is very useful for you to package all of that up to solve a very unique problem. And then you can also use that information package it up in your resume, package it up in your business proposal and take it to investors, take it to um, people that are giving money, right? Grant, grant um, people that are giving grants to your business. And you take that information in there and you say, hey, I surveyed 66 people. They have lupus. They want to transition to plant-based. I you know, I gave them this program, a six-week program, and 96% of them resulted in improvement in their symptoms. All of the information is there, and the investor will say, okay, the data is there. Let me give you $100,000 for you to start your ABC business, right? So that's how it works. You take your genius idea, you do market research and you use that research to build very unique programs. Now, I do want to address a couple other things in terms of um, making sure that your product is very unique. You have to do research, right? You want to research your competitors. You want to do a competitor analysis. You want to make sure that you are, again, providing something very unique. We don't want to copy here, right? So you're providing something extremely unique and there's no one like you because there is no one like you. Your idea is very unique. And then the other things you want to do is protect that idea, right? You want to protect that idea. We could probably talk about that in itself as a, as a webinar or a discussion, but you want to protect your idea. And one example that I did was I trademarked my business. So I applied with the government to protect Ginny Mac LLC as a business. And I made sure that Ginny Mac LLC is trademarked as a very unique business. So anything that I do inside of Ginny Mac LLC, I'll also trademark those services, right? So the Eat School with Jenny Mac is going to be trademarked. You want to make sure that as soon as you have your business idea, as soon as you validate it, you also do the legal work and trademark your business as well to protect it. Wow, I feel like you just took us to business school. <laughs> That's incredible. Thank you, Jenny. Um, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, the thing I used to hear around businesses was like branding, build your brand, communicate your brand. I'm curious about um, how did you, one, how did you build your brand and um, values that you use to build your business and how you're communicating that through the way you're interacting with your, um, with your audience or, you know, in the way that you're building your brand? Yes. Yeah. So branding is, is to me about authenticity, right? You, it depends on your services again, but you know, if you're creating a business based on a passion, whether you're doing it from for products or services, right? That's 
essentially an extension of your values. So for me, for the EAT School, for our community, our values are around compassion, empathy, love, leadership, all of those very important, uh, those at the essence of life, essentially. I make sure to incorporate that into my branding um, and into my products and how I want to show up and what I want to provide to my community. So branding is so important for you to really articulate your authentic voice, but branding is very important for you to align again to your value, to your value proposition and to how you're going to solve the problem. So branding for me is, is energy. It's, you know, how I, again, how I want to show up on a day-to-day -day basis, what I want to include in my programs, my products or services. And what Joanne just beautifully said, it's intention. It goes back to your mission statement. It goes back to your values. It's that ecosystem, right? And the clearer you are with your mission, your vision, your values is, is going to just translate into your brand. Now there are different types of brand. There's, there's a, there's a, you can build a personal brand, especially if you're providing a service. So it's very important to develop a personal brand. And through that branding, it's important for you again, to be authentic, but also tell a story because people want to know your story. People want to hear your story. People want to be able to see themselves in you. So it's important to show up as an authentic brand, as an authentic voice, and be very clear in terms of your values. So branding for me is, again, an evolution and a journey, and that's going to change as my business is evolving. So right now, I actually went through a whole brand audit um, where someone independently came in, they looked at my voice. They looked at how I'm showing up on the internet. So they looked at my social media platforms. They looked at Facebook. They looked at LinkedIn. They did a Google search for Ginny Mac. And basically they're looking to see how I show up in the world, right? And then what they did was they gave me feedback to say, this is how you're showing up. This is how people are perceiving you. Is that aligned to your values? Is that aligned to your mission statement? And I have some work to do, right? And my work is, again, really being authentic, telling my story, but doing it in a way that feels good. Gosh, there's so many things that you've said that are gems that I that I'm definitely going to watch this again and and write them down. I love what you said about branding is it's kind of like how you show up in the world and it's just an extension of who you are. I'm going to ask one last question and invite folks to 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 ask you questions as well. But what were I guess some of the biggest challenges you faced as you were starting out? Um, and maybe you know one thing that you wish someone had told you early in your journey before you started. Now looking back, you're like, you know, if I knew that, I wish I knew that before. <laughs> yeah, I would say there there have been many ups and downs uh, with running a business. I would say my biggest challenge is setting boundaries. Um, because as a business owner, right, it's your baby, it's your passion. Um, so there are times, there have many, there have been many times, and I'm extremely guilty of this. It's still a learning curve for me. There have been many times where I just can't separate just my personal life from my business. So if I'm out at dinner with my husband, for example, we're talking about work and I'm talking about how can I solve one of my client's problems? You know, for example, my client was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, for example, which is impacting and affecting our communities in a very disproportionate way. So my client is, is, is diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. And how can I help this individual essentially reverse that or just feel better? So I'm thinking about that, right? And I'm taking on the emotion and I'm taking on the weight of my community. And I find that sometimes that can 
overwhelm me. <laughs> that can drain me out because I'm not setting those boundaries. So that is one of my biggest challenges that I'm still working through is how I can separate my personal life from my business life. And some things I've been doing, I call them non-negotiables. So making sure that Wednesday is actually my day off. <laughs> Wednesday is my day off. I call it my wellness Wednesday. And on Wednesdays, I go for acupuncture. I go to the sauna. I take myself out for lunch. And I'm also trying to be very intentional about how I spend my weekends. You know, am I taking the weekends off? Actually, am I going out to enjoy time with my family and my friends, right? So it's so important for us to, as we think about becoming business owners and entrepreneurs, how are we taking care of us first and foremost? Because what I also learned is that we can't pour from an empty cup is what they say, right? If if we're empty inside, if we're depleted, then how are we going to give to others? So it starts with taking care of ourselves. So I have to be the um, leader, right, in this area. Um, that would be my biggest challenge. And the second part of that question is, is there something I would have told myself before getting into business? I would tell myself the same thing I'm telling myself now is just do it. Just do it, right? Just like Nike says, just do it, just do it. You are going to trip, you're going to fall, but you're going to get back up and keep going, okay? If it's your passion, that. if it's your love, you are going to do it and you're going to do it with so much love and it's going to be successful. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Thank you. And I love that you said that, like, you, you, I think throughout this whole conversation, you have highlighted how important it is for whatever business you're going into to be something you actually enjoy something that is your passion um so that it's it's you know it's not just an additional burden on you but it's actually something that you're striving really hard um to 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 start and i i want to voice what susanna, susanna put in the chat this process that you have just described jenny requires a lot of insight and knowing yourself do you have a personal or business coach yourself or where did you get meaningful advice or do you purely rely on your own research oh susanna coming with the the fire question that is such a very thoughtful question um so I, what I learned is that every coach needs a coach, right? We all need coaches. We can't do this alone. So yes, I have a coach, actually several coaches. I'm meeting someone tomorrow for them to help me through what I call energy work or Reiki healing. And that is a way for me to really think about how I could just balance all of the energy, all of the ideas and do it in a way that doesn't overwhelm me. So I have a yoga slash Reiki coach. And on Friday, I'm meeting with my business mentor um, who has extensive knowledge, 30 years plus of marketing knowledge um, that's led many positions, started many businesses, right? So I'm relying on the experts to help coach me through life. So not just provide life coaching, but business coaching. And um, yeah, it's taken me a lot to get where I am today, right? Just thinking about where I was five years ago, I'm not the same Jenny Mac. Um, I've learned a lot along the way, but I've also given myself grace, right? I've given myself grace and gratitude for getting to where I am today and trying not to beat myself up because most of the time we are our worst critics. So how can we be nicer to ourselves, right? Sometimes we'll say things that we don't even um, intentionally see that they actually are negative to us. So for example, we'll say, oh, that was so stupid of me. That's actually saying something negative to ourselves. So how can we, one, be mindful that we're saying those type of harmful words to us? And how can we re-engineer our minds to say, something nicer to ourselves. Great, right, and Joanne is putting some really helpful resources in the chat. But I also want to invite folks who want to voice their own questions, feel free to click the raised hand um, icon and we, we can, I can, you know, ask you to unmute and ask your question. 
Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions? Mm -hmm. Keep them coming. And I'm going to read what Joanne wrote because this Go is ahead. Yeah. Really helpful. Yes. Mastering diabetes book. Um, and both type one diabetes best book on it. Yes. There are just so many books and resources out there. The myth of normal. I haven't heard of that. I definitely have to look into that. So the rise of autoimmune conditions, especially affecting women of color, highly informative. I got my notebook here. I'm going to look into that. Yeah. But I would also say there's just, there's just so much out there, right? It can be somewhat overwhelming right just just so much information but i would say and this goes around um you know giving having insights and in, and in knowing yourself as susanna said it really just about taking it one day at a time because it can get very overwhelming but very importantly it's important to surround yourselves around those that are going to lift you up right? Those are who are going to share information, those who you aspire to be. So surround yourselves around those who, you know, want to pour into you and they want to see you successful. So that's also very important. Jenny, um, what is it that keeps you, I, you know, I, I, I know you said you've had ups and downs and I guess when you have mostly downs, what is it that keeps you engaged that keeps you excited about this work? What is it that, you know, gets you um, going whenever you, when, when you might have like a pretty down day or some disappointments? What are the things that make you feel like I should keep doing this or, or uh, uh, instead of just, you know, giving up? Yeah. Yeah. They're very, very good question. And um, in my particular case, I would say my husband has been very instrumental in helping me, you know, think through my thoughts, even if I think my ideas are crazy, or there are times where I just feel like, sometimes feel like giving up. I know I'm not going to give up because I'm a fighter, but sometimes, you know, it just gets extremely overwhelming. You know, we're inundated by information. We have social media. And then sometimes you might get into a comparison trap, right? Where you say, this person is already doing this or I'm not good enough. So it's always helpful to, again, surround yourselves around people that are going to uplift you. And in my particular case, my husband's been very instrumental. He also helps keep me accountable from showing me where I've been to where I am now. So he'll remind me, he'll say, oh, remember that time when you were in the hospital and you couldn't walk? And I've just gone for like a three mile run. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> Thanks for that reminder. So my husband definitely helps, but um, I'm very, very um, focused on self-care practices, right? As a self-care wellness coach, but thinking about ways that I can step away and be within myself, meaning how can I dedicate and commit to 30 minutes of alone time for me to just have a clear mindset. And in the morning, I'll also call that my non-negotiable time where I have to go to the gym um, or I have to go on a walk outside or I'll go, as I mentioned, look for mushrooms if it just rained outside or I'll learn about new plant species. I'll use my app to identify new plants. So it's just a way for me to recenter and focus when times get rough. I love that. I lo it, it sounds like um, whether intentionally or unintentionally, like you're in a business, but it's you've built in wellness in your business. So you're essentially being refreshed by your work and using that energy to go back to do um, something that could actually be stressful. So I mean, Thank goodness there, there are wellness coaches like you that folks who are going into other businesses that might not be wellness um, have access to. But Jenny, I want to, unless there's any other questions, any last minute questions before we close off? Any questions? I know there's one more question. I know right. <laughs> I have a question and maybe I'll just call on some names. <laughs> Maddie, Amina, Oscar, Eve. Anyone have one last question? 
Jamila, Giselle. Great. Well, we hope that people are pondering and just taking in everything that you've shared. And I, yeah. you know, if it's, I guess if it's okay with you, is it okay to share your email just in case folks think of questions later on? Yes, absolutely. Uh, let me put my email here. So it's hello at JennyMac.com. Very easy to remember if you remember my name. <laughs> if you have any questions, Yes, if you have any questions on how to start a business, mm -hmm. if you're looking for some mentorship, I also want to extend, you know, my time. Um, please reach out. Amazing thank you for that, Eve. Yeah. And I do want to say that it's very unusual that folks offer mentorship. So if you are thinking of starting a business, definitely take up this opportunity. Um, it's very helpful to have somebody who's like already walked a little bit farther than you help you walk through some, even if you're just right now, you just have an idea and you're not sure whether or not it's going to be a business. At the very least, have a conversation with someone. Um, and as Jenny said, uh, patent it. Like get, get a trademark, make sure that nobody uses or takes your idea. Jenny, we thank you so much for your time. Thank you for sharing with us about your whole journey through your business and how you, you know, you got from an idea to an actual um, business and um, thanks for your time. I, I, I've always wanted to try and get you to do something with us. So for me, this has been really exciting, but it really feels like we, we've, I at least feel like I've been to business school right now and uh, I feel like you've done a really great job to take really big concepts and break them down and hopefully this will get a lot of people thinking about their ideas about things they've always wanted to do and you know just doing it right yes yes okay. remember to take that genius idea and mm -hmm. just Great. Well, thank you everyone for joining. We will be back next week. And I believe we're talking about sourcing food sustainably next week. So feel free to join us um, and have a good evening. Good night, everyone. Thank you for coming. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night. Good night.